I kindly uh, welcome you to the talk of Bulgaria Protest 2020, uh, which is held by M. They are joined by Rosen, a journalist um, who's uh, very interested in the restrictions around uh, media freedom in Bulgaria. Uh, Sabina Hilayel, um, who is an um, assistant professor and uh, uh, does a science on uh, uh, the implications of uh, the transitions after the communist era. And uh, Ratka is a lawyer uh, and comments on uh, the ju judiciary situation in Bulgaria. Um, a nice welcome. And thank you. Thank go you. ahead, please. Thank you. Okay, now's the time, actually, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, let's go. If, if something happens, but it doesn't. No, it's, it's all right. You're wrong. Um, no, I'm just trying to share my screen, but right now um, it's not really responding. Um, let, me, let me try again, all right? I'll be right back. Just two seconds. So, a very nice start, right? I'm sorry. Let's see if that happens. Yes, right. Okay. Would you like someone from us to try it and share your uh, your presentation? No, um, it um, it doesn't. Um, Madam. We lost her. You're muted, Rosen. I mean that um, someone else could could start. Uh, time that uh, Maya is preparing herself. Um, hmm? Alright, could you want to try that? Yes, yes. Just let me open the presentation and I'll try it. Okay. Um, well, presentation, presentation. So let me see. I will need to improvise here, if you can hear me. Uh, help. So I am going to share the presentation now. Do you see something? I see my presentation. <laughs> you see your presentation, that's nice. So I have the wrong presentation. <laughs> Um, 
very sorry. Let's try like this. Uh, hello, people. My name is Radka. I'm a corporate lawyer uh, working in Bulgaria right now, but I have been an expat for 15 years. Um, our colleague M here was trying uh, to tell us some outlines about the situation in Bulgaria, the protests, and uh, why people suddenly went out on the streets, uh, which background uh, the whole thing has, and uh, which points uh, are we going to discuss here for further information. So um, let's start with the protests. As you know, uh, this summer in Bulgaria was uh, very hot. Radka, mm -hmm. I'm here. Oh, so, okay. all right. I'll just be very, very quick. Sorry, guys. Um, it didn't happen before with the sessions. So let's start with Bulgarian protest 2020. Overview context is Bulgaria. Um, just brief, um, involved in a first and second world on the losing side. Um, Communist Party, um, uh, ruled by the Bulgarian Communist Party, uh, facing uh, in the face lasting till 1990. Uh, transition um, uh, started with November 1989 with demonstrations there. Started the transition period, which um, we can feel till today, when marked with gun violence, killings, criminal activity, and lawlessness. Joined the EU in 2007, and in 2009, uh, Boyko Borisov um, became the Prime Minister with um, his populist center uh, right party GERP. So let's take a look uh, of the, uh, some of the current key political figures. Boyko Borisov's um, uh, career uh, includes membership in the Communist Party and his subsequent rise in the security services at that time. He had a security firm, bodyguard, then former communist leader, Dr. Zhivkov, you see, them, um, see him on the left, and a mayor of the capital, Sofia, and a prime minister. Um, uh, he has... Um, also for the achievements such as um, Stash of Euros in his drawer for uh, difficult times, um, a tape, uh, audio tape, heart uh, threatening to burn a member of the European Parliament, Elena Yomcheva, and a Barcelona Gate scandal about a 1.5 million house bought for his mistress, among others. Um, other key figure is media mogul Delan Pesky, uh, seen here on the left. A uh, politician, oligarch, media mogul, um, and according to many, he's the driving force in Bulgarian politics um, in his 20s, um, most notably still a student. He has the board um, of directors um, of uh, Varna Sport, one of the largest of the country. And in um, 2007, he was fired when he was a deputy minister without any repercussions. Um, notably, 2013, his appointment as president of the state agency for national security led to protests and um, later uh, the appointment, uh, this appointment was revised. And of uh, 2016, uh, he um, owns roughly 20 newspapers, right? Good. And we uh, see here that our chief public prosecutor since November 2019. We hear about him later in the talk. So um, let's see what's the current state in Bulgaria. Um, Bulgaria holds currently the 111th place in the World Press Freedom Index. Uh, according to Transparency International, Bulgaria is the most corrupt in the EU um, and is ranking actually 74th globally. Um, we hold the first place uh, in the European Union as in income inequality. Um, risk of poverty or social exclusion, and um, crime reporting as of data of 2018. And uh, Bulgaria but holds um, the last place in gross domestic um, uh, product per capita as in 2019. So let's see um, which several events preceded the protests in 2020. Mm, that would be um, the first uh, thing National Security Services guards uh, here on the, in the picture on the right. Uh, paid by tax money, uh, who were guarding a national property beach, declared to one of um, as a private residence, to an oligarch um, uh, named Ahmed Dugan, um, and um, here exposed by the politician Christo Ivanov, uh, opposition uh, politician Christo Ivanov, here with the flag on the left. Second, the previously uh, mentioned um, achievements of the PM Borisov, um, audio tape recordings and the thousands of euros in the drawer, in his drawer, um, as the, in the photograph. Uh, 
And third, the chief um, uh, public prosecutor Gershev raiding the offices of the Bulgarian uh, president, um, who is a prominent critic of uh, the party and him. So these several concrete reasons uh, and the general perception of injustice and corruption and abuse of power um, of PM Borisov and the um, prosecutor Gershev um, led actually to the protest in 2020. Um, so over, over of two videos actually um, made for a campaign for Silicon Valley Lion in September 2020, we, which we don't have any um, 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 any uh, da, 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 yes um, any reaction so far. I will tell some brief facts about the protests. So they began on uh, 9th of July, and during the subsequent months um, are marked with arrested protesters, blocked into city roads tent camps, uh, protests around the country and abroad. Um, some of the concessions of the Borisov's government during this period though, um, uh, thankfully to the protests, include uh, stimulus packages for the unemployed, health, uh, school students, a replacement of four government ministers, resignation of the Minister for Justice, two national security guards being fired um, uh, after the, the um, uh, pre-event. And on the 5th of August, during the GERBS ruling parties conference, uh, also notably some men affiliated with the party assaulted two journalists, uh, Paulina Paunova and Genka Shikerova, calling uh, the former trash and um, having her phone thrown several times with the warning that her um, presence is not welcome at all. So, um, and we come to the um, uh, 2nd of September, actually the um, a national, Grand National Revolt, um, where uh, it was followed by a police crackdown and where the violence escalated quickly. So police tear gazing and injuring protesters, using water cannons, attacking further with pepper spray and baton charges. A journalist, Dimitar Kenarov, uh, was beaten up uh, brutally kicked in the head, thrown to the ground, um, his camera was taken, um, and um, although he identified himself as a journalist um, many times, um, numerous media organizations such as uh, the International um, Press Institute um, expressed uh, condemned um, um, the, um, uh, the beating. And a further aftermath of the, this process include, for example, the rating of a business, uh, that was uh, supportive of the protests um, and uh, with the argumentation of, by the authorities of a discrepancy of in financial um, documentation or something with um, uh, of five euros. So briefly, supporters of the protests are actually uh, brought through the um, Mm, uh, through the um, uh, spectrum of society, uh, President Roman Radev, Security Union, nearly 170 scientists, the intele intellectuals and artists, students, a different organizations, anti-racism, disability and LGBT rights groups, trade unions and um, also immigrant uh, communities from all over the world. Uh, some of the protesting fractions include the civil movement fighter, um, Boets, which means fighter, but is an acronym for Bulgaria United with one goal, which notably today, um, um, this year, uh, sent an inquiry revealed to the European Commission revealing that um, um, misappropriation of funds uh, from a Bulgarian Minister of Agriculture, then the Justice for All initiatives, which demands deep reform of the judiciary, uh, the Poisonous Trio, um, a lawyer, sculptor, and a former radio journalist, vocal critics of the government, and uh, one of the main organiz organiz organizators of the protests. Um, and um, uh, the opposition party as Bulgaria and the civil platform uh, is Pravise Begie, uh, with um, similar goals, uh, mainly the judicial reform and the construction of the corrupt structures with uh, the party as Bulgaria. Um, so we come to the European uh, Union and its reactions, most notably um, on the 10th of July, one day after the starting of the um, protest, Manfred Weber, chairman of the EPP, um, you issued a support for the government of Borisov, still valid till this day. Funny enough, 
um, this particular sentence can be also truthfully read just um, by cancelling one, two words. DPP group fully supports the Bulgarian government and Boyko Borisov and its effort to protect the economy against the negative effects of fight against corruption and the progress that is being made to join the Eurozone. This is, of course, my personal uh, opinion. Uh, we further have the MAP, Roberta Mazzola, um, uh, also part of the EPP and um, her notable intervention at an attempt to suppress a Libe uh, resolution, um, EU com committee uh, is uh, on civil liberties, justice and home affairs um, uh, to, uh, to condemn um, the police uh, crackdown during the um, Bulgarian protests and, um, um, and to stand for the Bulgarian people in this uh, Libe, res uh, Libe resolution. Um, so, um, which was most notably with uh, her attempt was the deletion, the, the deletion of points addressing the misuse of the European funds um, and um, direct allegation of corruptions uh, towards the Prime Minister uh, Borisov written down in this um, Libra resolution, which was um, accepted um, actually on the, um, if I'm not mistaken, 8th of uh, October 2020. But um, yes, um, you have the slides, you can read. Um, it's very nice to see the inequitable support for the people of Bulgaria standing there. Uh, but we have also um, some friendly, honest faces. Uh, they need to be named um, uh, that um, expressed vocal support um, for the Bulgarian people and were on the ground uh, in uh, uh, several um, occasions. You see them here, Claire Daini, Daniel Freund, Ramona, Trugariu, Paul Tank, um, Ivan Simcic, and Sophie in Welt. <laughs> uh, and just a brief um, um, personal takeaway um, for me, it's uh, the protest for me was the long needed feeling of community, civic consciousness, activism, tolerance, and empathy. But uh, also we see problems that are still persistent visible today due to um, sexism, racism towards from many people and anti-LGBTQA, most notably uh, on the so online social platforms, which were for me uh, the main means to experience um, the protests. So that's um, actually for me. And now Sabina, political researcher, will be briefly discuss Bulgaria's transition in the context of communication mechanism between different groups. All right. Okay, thank you, Em. Uh, uh, this was a very, very quick but on the point um, representation of what's happening in Bulgaria. Uh, my goal here is going to be to position uh, what you just talked about in terms of the general transition of the country. Uh, and to talk a little bit about how civil society and the EU come together in order to help direct um, the efforts of the state institutions to transition. So, um, I'm going to try to share my presentation, but I think M is still sharing her screen. Is that the case? Uh, no, you can share yours. I'm out. I can share. Okay. Okay, do you see this? Yes, we do. Okay, so um, did you see me or do you just see my screen? You're with the screen, so. I'm with the screen, screen. okay. Okay, uh, so before I start talking about civil society, the EU and the state and my communication model, um, I want to preface this that um, I start with an understanding of democracy that requires uh, a debate and a discussion of different interest groups, uh, grievances and interests. And so in order for that to happen, we need to have strong civil society, right? Uh, I very much use a Lockean definition of civil society, one that follows John Locke, 
uh, which suggests that really the norms and the values by which society lives are uh, something that's created within civil society, and civil society is in charge of not only creating these norms and values, but also enforcing them. And the way civil society does that is by uh, instilling confidence and trust in state institutions, right? So in a way, providing state institutions with the ability to enforce these norms and values. Um, so what that means is uh, that one way to evaluate democracy or democratic transition in the case of some countries is to look at the ability of civil society to do that, right? To empower the state institutions uh, in, in, uh, to protect the norms and the values. Uh, the consequences of that is that once civil society um, in order to evaluate actually civil society, we need to look at their ability to instill trust and confidence in the government, but also withdraw trust from the government, right? And the way that happens uh, often, especially in transitioning countries, uh, and in the case of Bulgaria, is through protests. So the reason I'm interested in the protest is um, in all protests and in the transition is because they, the, the protest uh, serve as a measure of the success of um, the post-communist transition in Bulgaria. So this is on civil society. Um, another thing that I need to make clear here is that I am not looking at necessarily at the organizational structures of different actors. So I'm not looking at how civil society is organized or how state institutions are organized or how the EU is organized, but I'm looking at the interaction between these actors, right? So I'm looking at the way the EU communicates with the state or communicates with civil society, what's the role of civil society uh, in communication with the state and so on and so forth. So my communication model suggests that if the state is to actually guide uh, the country to a transition and achieve some type of consolidated democracy, uh, it has to have this pressure from the EU. Bulgaria has been a member since 2007. Uh, and even before that, through the conditionality approach, the EU applied that pressure. So I'm going to be looking at this connection between the EU and the state and how the EU um, impact the state in its attempt to transition to democracy. Uh, I'm also going to be looking at the way civil society sort of bottom up pressures the state. And I also be looking at the way the EU is connected to civil society. Now, the reason for this last connection is that um, really Bulgarian civil society and any post-communist civil society in the very beginning of the transition was not equipped well because of communist legacies because of different issues was not equipped well to apply this pressure to the state. Uh, so is what is actually the role of the EU in sort of teaching Bulgarian civil society uh, to play the role that civil society is supposed to play, right? And so in other words, what is the norm diffusion process by which the EU empowers civil society to put pressure on the state? Uh, the last connection that you see here is uh, what comes out from civil society and goes to the European Union. Uh, and to me, theoretically, the feedback is extremely important. So. Is there, uh, does civil society have the ability to actually provide the European Union with feedback uh, in terms of domestic particularities, in terms of characteristics of the country, in terms of what's possible and what is not possible, so that the EU can then just then adjust uh, its conditionality approach to the state? So I'm going to start with this relationship, and I will be uh, presenting the findings of two projects here, uh, which hopefully will come together in this communication model. So in, to measure the EU civil society interaction over the years, uh, I use social network analysis. Uh, and social network analysis is something that tells us about uh, interaction in a group of actors, uh, not necessarily the actors themselves. So what you see here are the results of this social network analysis uh, 
over time. So 2003, 2007, and sorry, this last one is 2013. Uh, that's my bad. Um, the, the specific score that you see is uh, something called eigenvector centrality. And eigenvector centrality determines the extent to which a particular node, in this case, the European Union, is essential for a particular network. In this case, um, NGOs, right, Bulgarian NGOs. Now, a side note, I had to use NGOs because social movements are pretty impossible to measure. Uh, so those are different NGOs which work in a network and then uh, the, uh, the EU is taken out on the top, uh, and this is uh, the, uh, the social network organizers represents the extent to which, in different years, the EU was central to the organization of these NGOs. Uh, what we see here is that in 2003, uh, EU was on the fifth place. In 2007, uh, it was on the second place, right? 2007 is uh, a year that was selected because of. Sabine, a bit the technical to set. I don't. It's in German. I don't speak German. So, what must we now prepare to do? Can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, yes. Somebody, um, um, yeah. may I? Somebody no, speaking I just, German, and I don't know if they're talking to me. No, I was, um, I was. Uh, it was my mistake. I'm very, very sorry. Uh, ah, but okay. uh, I will use that that we don't have um, too much time, perhaps. Okay. Um, um, uh, just a few. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So anyhow, the um, the result of that is that, um, and I need to shorten it, but. Um, the idea here is that the EU, so there are two interesting findings, right? The one is the EU gets involved a little bit later uh, with Bulgarian civil society. Uh, and as a result, Bulgarian civil society is incapable of really participating in the transition in these initial years of the transition, where, uh, for example, the constitution was written, a large body of legal code was produced, and civil society wasn't really there to um, to contribute. Uh, 2007, we see the European Union a little bit more involved, but in 2013, the European Union, again, is not involved. So that's my finding on the connection between the European Union uh, and civil society, and unfortunately, is not a good one. Um, in order to study the connection between the state and civil society, I look at um, the protests in 2013, which were very similar to me, uh, to the protests in 2020. And uh, I use linguistic models in order to, to determine the extent to which uh, the protesters in 2013 are actually communicating with uh, state institutions, in that case, the parliament. So the goal of this was to discover a set of rhetorical themes that are both politically interesting uh, but also and also partly differentiated. And so politically interesting means uh, uh, themes that are represented in parliamentary discussions more frequently than in everyday language, and partly differentiated means uh, phrases and themes that are more commonly used by one party over the uh, other. So. I downloaded all the uh, transcripts from uh, the parliamentary discussions during the times of the protests. Um, I created three language models. One was, well, the first one was a language model of the Bulgarian language, which is derived from Wikipedia, just because I needed a large corpus of Bulgarian language. Uh, and the purpose of that one was to get rid of all types of um, language parts that are not interesting. So propositions, uh, things like she, her, also, thing, uh, you know, Mr., uh, names, and so on and so forth. Then I created a language model of a collection of Bulgarian parliamentary transcripts and also uh, a different language model for each major political party. And so long story short, the results you can see on this slide 
Um, on the right side, you have what the civil society is talking about during the protest. Again, those are the protests in 2013. Uh, civil society talks about resignation of the government, new elections for parliament. Uh, they at one point wanted a change in the electoral system. The main grievance was transparency and accountability mechanism, uh, so anti-corruption practices. Uh, commitment to Bulgaria's European direction, European norms was something that they were using a lot. Um, and also some groups required direct democracy, uh, which means more referendums. So while civil society is uh, on the street asking for all these things, on the left side of the slide, you can see what parliament's talking about. So uh, on top is a a different parties. Uh, then you have on the side by month. Uh, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to go too much into it, uh, but you guys will have the slides to kind of look at it after that. Uh, the general idea is that really um, we observe a huge disconnect in the rhetoric of parliament and civil society. In other words, civil society is talking about major issues such as corruption, such as uh, lack of commitment uh, to European direction and European norms, while at the same time, uh, Parliament is discussing uh, tobacco production, local government, closing borders, uh, illegal immigrants, and so on and so forth, right? So the conclusion here is that uh, if we look at civil society, maybe we'll find that it's well-structured and organized. And if we look at Parliament and other institutions, maybe we can theoretically find that they're also well organized. But my uh, focus in this transition is the communication between the different actors. And through the social Thank network analysis and through this, I find that it's um, lacking. So sorry for taking more time. And thank you. Hello. Uh, do I uh, do I have to uh, do, do I get my time now? Yes, yes, but I think we can just uh, try to be very concise. I will, and I will try to, try to be very quick. So I'm going right. to be talking to you about uh, the protests and the background, especially the unprecedented uh, demand of the protests. Uh, it's unprecedented in the whole democratic world, as far as I know. And this is uh, the demand uh, for the resignation of the attorney general. Uh, as uh, far as uh, I am concerned, I have I haven't heard of uh, such a demand in any protests in the democratic Europe uh, so far. And it is interesting uh, to know why exactly the attorney general, what has he done wrong? So uh, I'll start with a quick background. The, uh, on July 9th, the, the protests uh, broke out uh, after a heavily armed uh, police forces uh, broke into the president's offices on assumptions. I, uh, I want to underline line the, uh, the word assumptions of um, dealing with influence, whatever that means. Um, so the prosecutor background for that was, uh, as M explained earlier, the opposition politicers, politicians, um, Christo Ivanov, who, um, who accosted to the beach of Rosenitz, uh, now a private residence of a former uh, political leader of Medogan, and uh, there he met um, national security guards who weren't supposed to be there. So the president commented on that, that uh, if the national security guards were still under his super supervision, uh, it won't, it wouldn't be happening. This this thing wouldn't be happening uh, a day later. The prosecutor, a known, uh, a known, um, how to say, to avoid the word accomplice, but <laughs> a known accomplice of the government, um, was uh, storming, was raiding the presidency, the president's building. And two hours later, after this, uh, this ratia, uh, the Bulgarian uh, society went on the streets. Uh, and this time it was not about uh, economical questions. It was not about money and social um, 
uh, social matters, but it was about protecting democracy because um, the uh, attorney general, this prosecutor in Angeshev, which we have uh, the pleasure of, of working with uh, since 2019, since December, uh, he was a very controversial figure since his election as the single candidate um, in one of his interviews uh, as a candidate uh, for the uh, for the position. He told he doesn't believe in separating the authorities into legislative, uh, judiciative, judiciary and administrative. So he practically stated out he doesn't believe in democracy. Then he was um, uh, flat out elected by the majority of the uh, of the uh, members of uh, judi the judicial uh, system, the judicial overseeing. Um, electoral system um well, there are protests against him then they are pro there are protests now and he started his career of course uh, with very controversial actions one of those um, which uh, involves uh, world cultural heritage uh, taken as evidence from one one successful businessman in uh, in Bulgaria who was uh, famous for his uh, collections of trash and heritage uh, unique uh, unique antiques uh, for the whole world for the history of Europe were taken in the, into plastic bags and locked into evidence um, so the prosecution said, but then two months later, two months later, uh, they popped out on the black market or on the antiques market. It was not really the black market. So uh, we all saw that uh, it was not uh, evident. The evidence they wanted uh, with with this uh, cultural heritage, they wanted the money. And um, upon these actions, uh, a, a German uh, a German expert from the Espionage Museum in Berlin, a historian, uh, he told for the Deutsche Welle for an analysis that um, the actions of the Attorney General Geshev are unprofessional, illegal, and scandalous. So does society thinks okay. Thank you. We have three or four more minutes for Rosan, and that's it. Okay. So that's why I'm just very stupid. It, it, um, it's me now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, uh, as you already heard, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, we have troubles uh, with corruption, with civil society, judiciary. And uh, as far as we know, uh, three key elements need to be present for uh, an efficient democracy. Uh, an independent judiciary, strong political opposition and free media. And uh, I could tell you that as a country, we are uh, uh, totally screwed. Uh, I started working as a journalist uh, then more than 15 years ago uh, in a weekly newspaper called Capital. It's one of the few free voices nowadays in, in Bulgaria. Um, when um, mm, uh, Bulgarian government and judiciary were trying to, to convince the European Commission that the country was ready to enter in the EU. The European Commission uh, has been closely monitoring the ongoing judicial reform, the fight against corruption and organized crime. Bulgaria became a member of the EU in uh, 2007, and uh, this monitoring, monitoring continued afterwards. Uh, back in uh, 2007, Bulgaria was on 51st place uh, in the World Press Freedom Index of Reporters Without Borders. Uh, and uh, what happened after uh, Bulgaria joined the EU? Uh, the media freedom uh, literally collapsed, and since 2019, Bulgaria is on, is on 111 place within uh, the Index of Reporters Without Borders. Bulgaria is somewhere around uh, um, countries where uh, political regimes are uh, putting journalists uh, in, in, in prisons because, because, of their, uh, because of their work. So we are the last place, uh, not only in European Union, but uh, in, in Europe as well. Till last year, the, the European Commission was silently observing the stagnation of the free press in Bulgaria. And that was totally inexplicable, uh, because the European Commission was uh, expecting from Bulgaria to, uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, uh, 
uh, judicial reform uh, and to, to fight against uh, corruption. Uh, and it's common sense that you could not expect effective uh, fight against corruption without strong and independent investigative journalism. It is common sense also that uh, you cannot have accountable and transparent institution if there are no journalists that are asking questions, simply asking questions to the government. You could not have uh, um, a critical mass of uh, within the society that could uh, go out on the streets and, 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 and protest if they are not well informed on what's going uh, in, in their own country. And back in 2019, the European Commission put down in their monitoring report uh, on the reform of judiciary and fight against corruption that the status quo of, of, of Bulgarian media uh, makes all those reforms uh, regarding judiciary and uh, fight against corruption uh, almost impossible. Uh, and the paradox is that it's the European Commission itself uh, is, is mainly to blame for, for the state of the media and freedom in Bulgaria. Because when Bulgaria became a member of the EU, uh, it started uh, um, receiving European funds. Uh, billions had to, to go to agriculture, infrastructure projects, education, science, reform of administration, judiciary. Instead, EU funds turned out to be a poison. Uh, and I'll explain you briefly why. Uh, they quickly become a major driver of the Bulgarian econo economy. They, uh, they endangered the competition because the government pre-allocated the public process, uh, pr public procurement to companies that are close to them. And uh, European funds are the ones that have contributed the most uh, to the state of the media in Bulgaria. How? Because each in each budget of um, um, European program, a certain amount uh, must be spent on publicity and advertising of that, that project. And with this money, society needs to, to learn what, what has been achieved with European funding, you know, to show the projects, the new roads, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the political class of Bulgaria quickly, uh, quickly realized that with this money, they could buy media comfort. So the media that were pro-government started receiving state funding through the European funds, and those who asked the questions to the government uh, will not allowed to, 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 to receive uh, such a money. In just single year, the state has become the largest advertiser in media. The government was buying media comfort with EU funds, and the EU was endangering the democracy uh, with, uh, within my country with using their own EU funds. Uh, over the years, uh, free voices become less and less. Uh, if a journalist showed the courage to investigate corruption within the government or simply asked the questions, he was immediately punished by, by, by the government. So, so um, I could just mention, uh, you could receive tax checks from the tax authorities, you could be uh, some month in, uh, in the police station uh, just for random questioning. But the most powerful weapon uh, of the government uh, is smear campaigns uh, in the yellow media, uh, tabloid media that are, um, uh, that are close to the government. Uh, it's it's quite it's quite um, an irony, but uh, one of those newspapers, which is very common and very very popular in Bulgaria, uh, was receiving uh, EU money uh, at the time that uh, the same website was uh, put on the list of uh, newspapers that are that were spreading uh, fake news on uh, on the European Union. Some of my colleagues uh, in the past year have received death threats from uh, on uh, uh, because of their work or even uh, you know indictments by by the prosecutor's office. It was not until the, this year that the European Parliament saw the problem and adopted a resolution on the rule of law and, uh, and media freedom in Bulgaria. Um, and uh, I'll finish with this. In my opinion, it. Uh, it's too late. <laughs> that's uh, that's briefly from me. Thank you. Um, thank you all. There is actually a question. We can perhaps uh, put it in very quickly, uh, which says, uh, why do you think um, EU-based news outlets outside of Bulgaria are basically ignoring this story, especially when Belarus is getting lots of coverage? I think that would be for you, Rosan. For uh, the past 15 years, I was um, I was working with with foreign journalists uh, that were covering Bulgaria. The the, the context is um, is very complex here in Bulgaria, and it's very hard uh, to explain what is going on in uh, in our country to to European audience. 
But I, I think that uh, when uh, the situation in Bulgaria um, is now in the uh, agenda of the European Parliament, uh, we saw in the last uh, six months uh, very um, in-depth pieces in, uh, in Central European uh, newspapers all over. Uh, I mean, in, in Germany, in France, uh, in Italy, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, so finally, uh, our foreign colleagues realized that uh, it's it's an issue, and uh, actually uh, they realized where uh, European taxpayers' money are going. Um, right. Um, I I think we're done. Um, perhaps a brief commentary. Um, from you, Radka, if you want to add something, because you were cut a little bit short in one, two sentences, I don't see anyone um, telling me I cannot speak. <laughs> so um, perhaps if you would like to, to, to make a summary or an abstract of what you wanted to say. Uh, thank you. I uh, I wanted to point out that uh, the judicial system in Bulgaria is uh, really up to a medieval level and uh, it starts with the attorney generals because um, as he likes, uh, as the Geshev, the, the, the current person in, uh, in service, uh, likes to call himself the instrument of God, uh, it's, it's not a normal thing. Uh, it's, I, I think we can finish with that because uh, anything I, I say after this uh, statement, um, it, it will be, it's not necessary. I, I think the, the, a person, a prosecutor who likes to call himself the instrument of God in front of or people <laughs> uh, is not suitable for such a uh, responsible service. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we don't have any uh, questions right now. I think we can uh, close it off um, with with, I don't know, perhaps we'll, I don't know, I'm not going to speak. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, well, thank, thank you. And I just want to say, you know, if anybody has further questions, uh, they can always contact at least me. Uh, me too. And I think my contact information is there. Uh, and Bulgaria needs a lot of help in all of different aspects. So a discussion is where things start. So uh, at least I'm open to talk about this more with all people. Super. Thank you. Thank you. We can we have to finish now. Okay. Thank you guys. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you.